Hello, my name is Harold Hafton, and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft, and I thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we're going to be excavating an ocean ruin. Now, I want to be clear from the onset that I'm not an expert in underwater archaeology, nor do I have personal experience in underwater archaeology. When I was working as a real archaeologist, all the excavations I were part of were on dry land. That said, I thought it would be fun to excavate an ocean ruin and to do that survey and excavate using the techniques used by underwater archaeologists and underwater archaeological principles. However, as I'm not anywhere close to an expert on this one, if there are any archaeologists watching this who have further information or corrections to either correct me or expound upon what I'm saying and talking about in the comments. Now, all that out of the way, what I'm planning on covering here is surveying, documentation, excavation techniques used by underwater archaeologists, and to cover a few other things of note, like the differences between archaeology on land and archaeology underwater while I'm excavating this ocean ruins. So, what is underwater archaeology, you ask? Underwater archaeology is a broad term that covers using archaeological practices to study human life, culture, artifacts, and physical remains in an underwater setting. This might be using those practices to excavate in and around crannogs or bridge footings or items in a river. Incidentally, if you want to learn more about crannogs, I have an episode about that on my channel where I recreate one of those. Underwater archaeology also has items under it, like maritime archaeology, or the study of archaeology about things related to the sea, which can include things like lighthouses, harbors, and ports, marine archaeology, which deals with items submerged in a saltwater environment, or nautical archaeology, where it relates to items like ships and shipwrecks, but also, like maritime archaeology, deals with things that aren't underwater, so for example, like a Viking ship burial. It also goes without saying that there are some fundamental differences between regular land-based archaeology archaeology and underwater archaeology, which is why even if an archaeologist has experience and a degree in land-based regular archaeology, additional training, degrees, and or experience is needed for underwater archaeology. First off, working underwater poses different problems and more risk than a regular archaeological site would. You need to be aware of sharks, other fish, or dangers with equipment malfunctions in a way that you wouldn't need to on dry land, unless you're like from Sharknado or something like that. Though regular archaeologists do have to be concerned with things like bees or wild animals, or potentially dangerous people, or dangerous site conditions even when working on land, these dangers are far more pronounced and acute when working underwater. I'm sure beyond having to worry about my air supply in this episode of Minecraft, I'll also have to be doing my fair share of protecting myself against drowned. Thankfully for this episode, Minecraft doesn't have any sharks. Preservation of artifacts are also different underwater or in salt water than they would be on land. It's very rare to have preserved organic materials such as wood on land. However, that's far more likely to be preserved underwater in its low oxygen environment. Iron and other metal artifacts also have a different preservation profile underwater as the salt from the seawater can infiltrate into the artifact. As such, how an archaeologist needs to conserve the artifacts or ecofacts is vastly different for land-based or underwater excavations. One very cool thing about underwater sites, though, is that they're far more likely to be a snapshot of a single day in history. This is particularly true of shipwreck sites. Often on land-based sites, the archaeological site might be inhabited for hundreds or thousands of years, and so that site necessarily reflects the complex stratigraphy, but rarely in land-based sites do archaeologists get a snapshot of what the site was at a single point in time. That's part of what makes sites like Pompeii so useful and rare. With a shipwreck, though, the ship sank just once on a specific date, on a specific time, not over a long time span. And so that allows archaeologists to learn much by the items associated with that shipwreck to be able to extrapolate pieces of knowledge like trade networks or to make new radiocarbon or tree ring dating connections between the wood found in the ship's hull and the ceramics found in the ship's cargo hold. Okay, enough talking about underwater archaeology more generally, and let's start with our specific ocean ruin site. Before I can start the excavation, though, I need to do a survey of the archaeological site. With underwater archaeology, there are some additional challenges with identifying the position of the site, because the sea or ocean is always rocking, and you can't often see the site underwater. Fixing the position of the site is tougher than on land. How you can fix that position can be done with either optical methods or electronic methods. The simplest method of optical position fixing is probably using transit lines. So this is where you establish a line of sight with two or preferably three fixed charted features. 
So let me pull out my map and you can see that in advance, I put a couple of pillars out in the distance and you can see that if I line them up visually in two different axes that can help pinpoint where in the sea my boat is over the site. You can see that if I move over here, they aren't lined up. And then if I move back over to where I was, they are lined up and you can see that I'm just about in the right place. There are other optical methods like using compass bearings, a sextant, or using a theodolite from land to help measure the locations of things like position buoys or other key points. A theodolite, incidentally, is a surveying tool used for measuring the horizontal and vertical angle for a known point that allows you to use some maths to determine the position of other points out in the distance. Normally, I think most people use a total station these days, which is basically like a theodolite that uses, I think, either infrared or lasers that shoots out and reflects back and allows the total station to do all the maths automagically for the operator. You can't use either a total station or a theodolite from a ship as the rocking of the waves makes it so it wouldn't work. So you have to be on land to use them. The far easier way, both in real life and in Minecraft, to fix a position though is using GPS to capture the longitude and latitude, which in Minecraft would be equivalent to simply pushing F3 and looking at the XYZ coordinates. Now that we have a fixed position of the site in space, we can start our survey and our search. Like on land, you can do a geophysical survey, but in the case of underwater archaeology, those tools would be using echo sounders or sonar, but we're going to do a physical survey in this case. In the real world, you can do that with a toad search where the diver uses a propelled vehicle that pulls them along while they're looking around the site, kind of like an underwater scooter. But you could also do a swim line search. That's where a group of divers go out at regular intervals and then swim in a straight line and then cover an area in a specific direction. So basically, like you would if you were walking a field looking for artifacts, going back and forth and back and forth up and down the field, like you would when you're doing a land-based site survey. You could also do a grid search where you would create a grid on the seabed laid out at specific intervals and then you can search within each square. You can see that I used that method here where I'm laying out white glass panes to mark the survey grid on this site so I can keep an organized record of the artifacts found in each grid square. In Minecraft, some other ways to mark off a grid would normally be string or redstone, but those don't work underwater, so that's why I'm using the white stained glass panes. You can also do a circular search where you place a central fixed point in your site let's say in the middle of your site, and then use a cord or a rope laid out with a predetermined distance intervals marked in it, and then you can swim in a circle holding the rope around that fixed point, and then go out to the next predetermined distance mark on your rope, and then swim in another circle, etc., and then repeat that until you've covered the whole site. Metal detectors are also often used by the surveyor to help them identify artifacts that might be just below the surface, in the sediment in the mud. While doing the survey, the diver needs to be careful to minimize stirring up too much sediment as visibility can be a major problem while doing surveys and conducting your excavation. As such, it's very important beyond keeping accurate drawings and documentation during the survey and excavation, just like you would with every other archeological site. But with underwater archeology, span because the sea is ever shifting, tides and currents move things around, including the divers keeping accurate records are even more important. It's also important to keep a solid photographic and video documentation of the site, the survey, and the excavation because of those ever-changing site conditions. Because of the low visibility, it's often impossible to create large-scale site complete pictures of the whole site and show an underwater site from end to end. And so use of a photographic mosaic are often used and are important. If you've ever taken a picture with your Android or iPhone to create a panoramic shot where you kind of move your phone around to see different angles and then the smartphone software stitches all of those individual pictures together to create one big picture or panoramic view, that's basically what a photo mosaic is. 
because sediment's so easily stirred up, a number of articles I read say that you should take your pictures in the middle of the day when the light penetrates as deep as possible through the water and to make sure to schedule a time to take those pictures when the currents are calm, making the water as clear as possible. As far as excavating an underwater site, that's done a bit differently and using different tools than the techniques used by an archeologist that they would use on land. Because in a lot of cases, the mud and sediment on the bottom of the sea or ocean is often loose, especially when compared to the clay likes found on land. It is often possible for the excavator to just use their hand to brush away the sand. Fanning is also used where you can use the water to your advantage to gently brush away sediment without having to touch the area with your hand itself. Smaller artifacts uncovered like this can be cataloged and then brought to the surface by hand by the excavator or someone else on site. If the artifact's larger, an airbag can be used that can then be inflated and lift the artifact. Bigger artifacts yet can be lifted using a winch mounted to the ship that's likely above the site, or using specially designed pontoons. Another underwater tool archeologists use to excavate sites are airlifts and water dredges. Basically, it's like a tube that's placed vertically and uses either air in the case of airlifts or water in the case of water dredges, and it gets injected into the tube and creates a suctioning action, which pull material from the bottom of the tube up to the surface of the water. Basically, imagine it's like a giant straw that sucks stuff up from the bottom of the sea and brings it to the top. This material that's sucked up can then be run through a screen or a sieve where any artifacts or ecofacts can be collected. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed my ocean ruins excavation and our chat about the basics of underwater archaeology. As I said in the beginning, because I don't possess any firsthand experience in this, if there are any archaeologists with that firsthand experience or knowledge watching this video that can elaborate or correct anything I said in this episode, please feel empowered to do so in the comments so that we can all learn a little bit more about this fascinating topic. As normal, I put the resources I uncovered while doing my research in this video in the description below so you can check them out if you want to learn more. If you want to watch me excavate a trail ruins or hear me tell some stories about my time on an excavation in Ireland, please click on these links here to watch these videos. Well, that's it. Thanks. Like and subscribe. Do all the things. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.